Welcome to Stories That Matter. I am your host, Doug Thompson, with my special guest, Robert Morgan. And Robert, you're in Nashville right now, aren't you? Yes, sir, I am. It's a beautiful morning here, not as hot as it's been, and and um, but I've got a cold, so I may sneeze or cough at any moment. I've got one of those summer okay. colds. Listen, we've all had colds. We'll be fine. We'll make it through this. Robert, I, uh, I have a question for you right here at the beginning. And I always ask this when we do the stories that matter. Somebody, somebody invested in you when you were a young kid. Who was it that invested in you? Because most people can't grow up to be a book writer like you and get 35 books and be a, 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 a preacher and give the message and, and be a speaker like you. To somebody, somebody invested in you and recognized your gift that you had. Who was it? Well, I had a lot of people and I'm very fortunate. Uh, I had two wonderful parents. They were both school teachers, John and Edith Morgan. And I remember uh, learning to read by sitting on my dad's lap and he would read books to me and then he'd begin to show me the words. And, and over time he taught me to read and, and he got books for me. And so I grew up reading and uh, loving books. I wasn't very athletic and they never enrolled me in any sports. I don't know why, but, uh, but I became more of a reader, more of a student. And I think over time that served me well. I also had a very good pastor and he was my pastor for many years in my life. And he would, he would always uh, take time to talk with me and to encourage me. So, uh, you know, if you have two good parents and a pastor in a small mountain town, then you're very fortunate. It was a wonderful, um, wonderful opportunity for me um, to, to have a good foundation. Well, I would certainly agree with you. What town was it? It was called Elizabethton, Tennessee. Uh, I oh, still yeah. have a, a home near there. I plan to go up tomorrow, actually. Uh, there's a, a, just a a wonderful, beautiful place on the Appalachian Trail called Roan Mountain, R-O-A-N, Mountain. And it's the largest rhododendron gardens in the world. Um, and it's on, it's on the Appalachian Trail. So that's near where I grew up. And uh, I hope to go up tomorrow and see the beautiful blooms that they, every, every year they bloom. And uh, tell me about your family. Well, um, after I left home to go to Columbia Bible College in South Carolina uh, and graduated there. That's where I met my wife, Katrina. And we were married 43 years. Uh, she developed multiple sclerosis. And so her um, last several years, I was a caregiver. We say that we were caregivers to each other. And, um, and she passed away about 18 months ago and moved into the celestial city. She, um, um, she was uh, getting, really, it was very difficult for her near the, um, the last year or so of her life. But we, we stayed cheerful, and, uh, but I miss her. We have uh, three daughters, and they all live in the Nashville area. And between them, we've got 16 grandchildren and two great-grandchildren and one on the way. So they all live uh, relatively close to me. So, so I don't get very lonely. I'm very fortunate. Oh, you got a big family, and that's that's awesome. The grandkids and great grandkids are they're exciting. I'm at that stage too, and and uh, and it's fun because you can see your relatives in each of those kids. You can see those characteristics and those things, and that's awesome. Well, you know, Robert, I have uh, I I read uh, a little bit in one of the articles up here that you've written 35 books. I'm looking behind you right now. All those books behind you are those ones you've written and or are research books. I'm only kidding about writing all of those books, but I know you've written 35. Uh, those are um, just books that I use for research and uh, people ask me if I've read them all and I have read a lot of them. Some of them you don't, they're not really intended to read. They're intended to, to dive into when you need some particular fact or, or something, you know, so the nature of commentaries and research books uh, is a little bit different than inspirational books. But uh, I learned to preach by writing out my sermons, Doug. Um, I began preaching when I was just a young man, a teenager, really. 
uh, over 50 years ago. So I've always written out my sermons. Now I preach them without notes, but I find if I write them out and if they are expositional, especially if they go right down the text, um, then uh, there's real quality material, not because it's me, but because it's God's word. And so uh, when I moved to Nashville and began preaching, there are a lot of publishers in Nashville. We have uh, Thomas Nelson and W and the various components of uh, uh, Harper Collins Christian publishers here. We have the Baptist Lifeway and, uh, and the Methodist Publishing House. This is just a mecca of publishing houses. So it was um, the Lord just opened doors that I didn't expect to take my written sermons and convert them into more book form. And that's really the way that I started writing. I would either take my sermons or in some cases, the stories out of my sermons that I used and would compile them into resources for pastors or other things like that. And, and then, you know, it just went from there. I've gone nearly 30 years uh, without being, without a book contract. Sometimes it gets a little heavy, um, but, um, but, you know, I, I enjoy doing it and I'm thankful for the opportunity. Are you still, uh, are you still writing books? Yes, sir. Um, I wrote a book about 20 years ago called The Red Sea Rules. And it's been, we have about 750,000 out there. It's, it's been amazing how many churches and Bible studies have used that. And it's from Exodus 14 on the parting of the Red Sea and how the Lord helped the Israelites through that very difficult time. Well, we've just, and this is a copy of it. It's just a little book here. Um, but that was 20 years ago. So my son-in-law has been telling me now for years that we need to do a, a, a different, um, we need to do a, a follow-up to it. And he studied and thought and came back with the idea that the Jordan River parted for the Israelites, just the way the Red Sea River of the Red Sea had parted for the Israelites. He said, you need to write about that. So I began studying it right after my wife passed away. Uh, and the verses just struck me. It says, God said to Joshua, Moses, my sermon is dead. Now you go on to the next stage of your life. And I studied those six chapters of Joshua that talk about the Israelites getting ready and crossing the Jordan River. And we just have published the Jordan River Rules, uh, which is um, the sequel here to the, to the Red Sea Rules. And it just has come out, and that's my most recent project. Uh, and I feel like it will be encouraging to many people. It's how yeah, to, sure how to be, yeah. go to the next stage of life. If you're a high school graduate or a college graduate, or you're getting a new job, or you're retiring, or you're getting having a baby, or uh, whatever it is, you know, the Lord leads us in stages. It says in Numbers chapter 33, the Lord said to Moses, write down all of the stages through which I have led you. So how do we go to the next stage in life? Well, the Lord goes ahead of us. He parts the waters and he leads us. Amen to that one. Amen to that one. Going to look forward to the uh, new book coming out. And of course, when we get to the end of this Zoom program, we'll put the contact information up. So people who want to get one of your books can and, and those who may be interested in having you come out as a speaker, why they'll be able to make contact with you because I know you do a lot of speaking engagements. You, you still uh, also uh, uh, preach from the pulpit too, don't you? Yes, at my own church. Uh, I don't do it every week now because when Katrina's illness progressed to a certain point, it just became too heavy to bear the entire load of a growing church while I was trying to take care of her, as well as uh, the books that we were trying to produce. So I've moved to a position for five years now. I've been the teaching pastor at my church. So I preach once a month there in the pulpit on Sundays. And I do other things uh, at the church. I mentor and I teach a class, um, but I only preach once a month at my own church. But the other Sundays, I'm usually somewhere else preaching or teaching. Uh, or sometimes I just attend like a regular worshiper, which is very nice. 
Well, well, Robert, where do you think we are right now in, uh, in the, uh, where do you think we are in history? As the Lord looks at it now, I hear lots of people saying, we believe what we're in the end times. What, what's your feelings? Well, we know we're in the last days because the last days is a period of time that began, I think, with the day of Pentecost and will end with the return of Christ. The Bible talks about these last days. But I think we may be in the last days of the last days because we are seeing an acceleration of evil that exceeds anything that we've seen before. Uh, what China is doing with technology to surveil their citizens and to oppress the Christians there, uh, the weapons that are falling into everybody's hands, the danger of pandemics and, uh, and of a global pandemic that could be far worse than coronavirus the possibility of um, the destruction of our electrical grids because of hackers. And just today, the Wall Street Journal had an article on how close we may be to a total economic collapse because of how indebted the entire world is, and especially the debt of the United States. The politicians now aren't even talking about it. They're just, uh, we are racing into a level of indebtedness that nobody in all of world history has ever known before. And these are precipitating events. Uh, and the Bible says, recognize this, that in the last days, perilous times will come. In our own society, here in the American society and in the West, um, we've had a couple of victories in the courts, but overall, the tenor of our secular society is becoming more and more intolerant towards Christians with a view towards uh, trying to silence uh, conservative or Christian voices. So we, we just need to be aware of all of this. To me, it isn't, I wouldn't say that I'm frightened. Um, in fact, Jesus said, when you see all of these things happening, lift up your head because your redemption is drawing near. But I do think that we need to recognize that there are trajectories and trends right now in our nation and in our world that exceeds any level of danger that we've ever known before. And that should make us all look forward to the uh, hastening of the coming of Christ. Where do you see the churches right now? And I'm talking about the, the churches across the United States right now. Where are the churches in this? Uh, are we uh, buying into what's happening, uh, or are we concentrating more on the Word of God? And, and I know there's some of each end of that, but what, what's your general feeling, Robert? We are very concerned right now. I'm very concerned about the dangers of what is called progressive Christianity. Uh, and evangelical, or churches and pastors with evangelical roots that are selling out the gospel in the name of love and tolerance uh, so that the doctrines um, of the atonement, uh, the truth of the sanctity of uh, uh, marriage, of human sexuality, those things are being compromised right now in a lot of churches and in a lot of pulpits. Uh, we, I think we need to be very careful about that um, and be on guard against it. Uh, but there are there's a whole generation of young pastors coming along now that are true to the word. And, um, and I'm encouraged by that. I see it when I travel around. I know that there are, uh, I speak in a lot of churches that are, are large churches, but they have young staffs, but they are committed to scripture, to integrity, to maintaining the distinctiveness of our, our faith and the sanctity of our views on life and sexuality and marriage. So I think there is still, there is still a core of strong Christians and strong churches in our nation. And, you know, if there had just been 10 people in Sodom, God would have spared the city. Um, on the boat on the Mediterranean that was going down the ship, we had Paul, Luke, and Aristarchus, three people there on a ship of nearly 300 people. One percent that we know of on that ship belonged to Christ, but the whole ship was saved because of that one percent. 
And Jesus said the church, the kingdom of God is like 11. You know, when you bake something, I'm, I, sometimes I'll bake something. You use, you know, two or three cups of flour, but only a little bit of yeast. And um, so I'm not overly discouraged, but I'm aware of the fact that there are trajectories happening in American society that are very intolerant toward biblical voices and biblical truth. And we just need to keep standing up with courage against that. In regards to, uh, in regards to what's going on right now, do you see the rest of the planet is beginning to uh, decay in their worship of the Lord? Those countries that, uh, for instance, in Africa that have made um, tremendous gains and churches have been planted in Africa. Africa is doing a fantastic job in many of the areas. We, we do some things in Kenya and uh, we're, just, uh, we're just excited about some of that that's taking place. And yet in other parts, we see that it is, it is like when they talk about religion, the church, the Lord, it's, I don't even recognize what they're talking about in some cases. And in other cases, uh, it's, it's just fantastic how strong they are in their faith. Now, I don't suppose that's been any different from the beginning of time, but uh, it seems a lot worse right now. Maybe I'm just more sensitive to it that, that as I hear those words, I say, what, what are we doing? How does this work? I don't understand. Well, I, I think the Lord is working very powerfully all over the world. Here in America, I do think there are real pockets of revival. I think that there is a generation of young people coming along that are committed to the Lord. And Europe, Europe is very, very difficult. In uh, Finland now, there is a very powerful politician, a lady who is facing prison time because she is an evangelical Christian and has spoken out in favor of a biblical view of marriage. And in Finland, which is known for its tolerance, they're intolerant at that position. And she's facing a real legal challenge um, just because she, she will read from Romans chapter one um, on, the, uh, on the sanctity of uh, human sexuality. So Europe, uh, there are pockets of encouragement. Northern Ireland uh, has some great Christians there that are really setting things on fire. Uh, and Africa, North Africa, of course, is, is so heavily Islamic. Um, but there are people coming to Christ there uh, among the Muslims in a remarkable way, many of them, you know, in, in unconventional ways. Um, in Sub-Saharan Africa, the, there are so many failed states and the political situation is so unstable that it always makes it dangerous for Christians, but there has been a tremendous growth of the church there. And we hope that there will be theological maturity happening along with the uh, numerical growth. I think in the Middle East, in Iran, there are incredible stories of people coming to Jesus. The Iranians are experiencing a revival that is frightening to the Ayatollah. Um, it's amazing what, you know, the reports that we hear out of Iran, um, North Korea is, is the most difficult of all of the nations. It's the number one uh, opponent. There are powerful demonic forces in, in charge of North Korea. Um, but I think, you know, we still believe that there are a lot of Christians there, many of them in concentration camps. And I pray every day uh, that that government will, will collapse and, and that the South Korean Christians and the Chinese Christians will merge together to evangelize um, North Korea and that the entire peninsula. Uh, in Asia, um, well, in, in other parts of Asia, I think there's there, there are pockets of revival. Uh, so Doug, I think that around the world, uh, you know, in South America, we see some real growth in places. Around the world, it's, it's though it reminds me of the book of Acts. There are some places where there's resistance, some places where there's opposition and persecution, and some places where the Holy Spirit is working and people are coming to Christ. So I think overall, when I look at what the Lord is doing in this world, 
I'm encouraged. The church has never been as large or as strong or growing like it is right now. Part of that is because we have more people, but part of that is because the Holy Spirit is still working. Good, good. Are you uh, working on a new book right now, Robert? Uh, yes, sir. We just published um, this book, 100 Bible Verses That Made America, and it's on the role of the Bible in American history and 100 pivotal people or moments when the Bible made a difference. And it's been made into a Fox Nation television series. And so we're still doing a lot of uh, promotion here, trying to get America to recognize her biblical heritage. And, um, and I have a book coming out next year that we've just wrapped up. It's called The 50 Final Events in World History. And it's a study of the book of Revelation. I believe that Revelation is given to us simply enough that every Christian should understand it without being intimidated by it. And so I'm, I've taught it for 50 years and I've just broken it down as simply as I could. And so this book will be out next year. It's called The 50 Final Events in World History. Fantastic. We're going to watch for that, Robert, and we'll put the contact information so that good folks watching the Zoom program will be able to go to your website and uh, take a look at your books. And uh, the ones you're talking about coming out just sound fantastic. Robert, thank you so much for taking time to visit with us today. You're welcome, Doug. It was my pleasure. And the Lord be with you until we meet again. And with you.